Good morning, dear friends, and happy Easter. Our Lord is risen. Amen. 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 Well, I trust that you're all enjoying the favor of our God in this time of celebration. Our Lord has risen from the grave. I came across a post on Facebook. Uh, I think it was this morning. Could have been yesterday. It was a post that uh, Rob Reimer, Dr. Rob Reimer posted. And I just feel to, to read it to you. So with acknowledgments to Dr. Reimer, here goes. Jesus is alive. It is simply the greatest truth ever spoken. All hope hangs on this one premise. Paul said, if it isn't true, we are still in bondage to sin and death, and we are to be pitied above all people. Jesus wasn't merely a good teacher. He wasn't simply a miracle worker. He wasn't just a compassionate caregiver. Jesus was victorious over sin. He defeated evil. He overcame death. He is the source of life. He is the fountain of hope. He is the path to soul cleansing. He is the way to the Father. He is the gate to eternal life. He is the King of all. He is the all-sufficient source. He is the Redeemer of all who welcome Him. He is risen. He is alive. And all hope depends on this truth. There is no one like Jesus. Amen. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, amen. The enemy thought that he had triumphed over the Lord. That's what he thought, but no ways. Jesus won this battle, and he reigns victorious. And that is why I can wish each and every one of you a happy and blessed Easter. This morning we... We're going to be celebrating this amazing God that we serve. We're going to be partaking in the communion. What an opportunity to celebrate the Lord. By way of announcements, sadly, our provincial authorities have again placed several restrictions on our gatherings. I want, to, I want you to continue praying for our leaders, for your church leaders, but pray for each other as well. And also, let's continue praying that this crazy COVID season comes to an end. I want to thank each and every one of you, and today in particular, for honoring God with your tithes and offerings, love gifts, your faithfulness and generosity, even during this incredibly tough time of COVID, financial difficulties, and and a whole lot of other stresses. Praise God for your faithfulness. Our online giving has been very helpful for many, and so we continue that. But for those that like to come and drop off your gift, won't you do so between the hours of 9 and 12, Monday to Friday? Just a reminder that Daryl and company meets every Sunday morning from 9 until 10 via Zoom. This is a time of journaling, it's a time of prayer, it's a time of discussion, reflection, But you do need to have an invite from either Daryl. You can contact myself or Daryl just to get the Zoom invite for that. By way of reminder, our Wednesday and our Sunday COVID support groups um, have come to a close up until, well, we'll make an announcement as soon as we're here, but we imagine it'll it'll probably resume again around about mid-April. Our dear brother Roberts preached last week on godly authority, and I've received so many positive responses during the week. I've received, I don't know how many, just so many phone calls, so many discussions. People have just said to me how blessed they were, how timely it was. I encourage encourage you this morning to, if you have some time, if you don't, can ask you to make some time, but I would encourage you to, to listen to that message yet again. And I say thank you, dear friend, thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your obedience in bringing that word, because a timely word, to the body of Christ. Next week, we can look forward to our captain, Slade Compton, as he breaks open the word of God to us. I honestly believe, if you look over his shoulder, you'll see why I believe this, but Slade walks in a very strong apostolic 
anointing. I believe that he's got the mantle of an apostle. And I believe that next week, Slade is going to be breaking open some foundational truths. Our faith is built on the apostles' doctrine. That is the foundation to what we believe. And I'm looking forward to Slade as he speaks next week. Who knows what the Lord holds in the future? But I'm looking forward to Slade. I'm looking forward to you just releasing that which God has placed on your heart. Amen. Yeah, amen. So this morning, I'd like to invite every one of you to join us as we worship our God, as we worship our risen Savior. Let's have fun as we enjoy our precious God. Amen. Captain. Amen. Well, let's just take a few minutes to stand. I just want to, uh, even in, in your place, let's just kind of just prepare our hearts just to worship God, okay? So let's just, uh, let's just welcome him in here today. Father, we want to welcome you here. We want to just yield ourselves to you, God. We just thank you, Lord, that we can count and trust in you. Not only are you the re you re were raised from the dead 2,000 years ago, but you could raise us up out of slumber, out of apathy, out of uh, lethargicness, Lord. You're a, more, a God that is able to do more and uh, abundantly more than we can even ask or think. So today, Lord, we just say, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord. We want to just praise your name. We want to just shout a hallelujah to God. We just want to thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We exalt you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Verse one again.
to face the day. Yes, we do. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Yes, Lord, we just want to welcome you. We want to let our faith arise into you, Lord, today. Hallelujah, God. We just, we're just excited about the miraculous work that you've done by even raising from the dead. Let faith arise. In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you. No matter what I feel, let faith arise. Let faith arise. For my champion's not dead, he is alive. And he already knows my every need. Surely he will come and rescue me. Verse 1 again, right from the top. Let faith arise For my traffic Lord, I believe But help my unbelief I choose to trust you No matter what I feel Let faith arise Let faith arise for my champion's not dead, he is alive. Yes, he's alive. And he already knows my every need. Surely he will come and rescue me. God of miracles come, we need your supernatural love to bring You're the God of miracles. Let faith rise and see the kingdom come. I lift my eyes, for the battle has been won. My God is faithful, and every single word He says is true. Every 
single word he says is true. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. 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 Sing
open his melody, sing a little louder.
wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of want to just, as your spirit is being released, Lord, to bring healing, deliverance, ministry, Lord, whatever the need is here within our own body here, without on media, Lord, around the nations, Father, because of your resurrection power, we just release this right now in Jesus' name. There's nothing could hold you in the grave. There's nothing that could stand against it. Greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world, Lord. And we just release this power of God right now to flow across our nation and around the world to set people free, God. You rose from the death that we could walk in victory and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
received from the Lord, but also delivered to you. And the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Someone once said that you can't tell a story from one isolated frame in a video, in a movie. You need to let it play from beginning to the end to know what actually happened. But the frame that we see in that particular portion of Scripture we've just read tells a story of God's great love for us. And it's with gratitude, with great gratitude and love and thanksgiving, we remember this. We remember His death. We remember His burial. But there's so much more. We remember His resurrection, dear friends. And today we celebrate both the Lord's death and the Lord's resurrection. Jesus conquered the power of the enemy. He conquered the grave. He conquered the power of sin and death. Amen. Whilst on the cross, Jesus took the sins of the world upon Him. He paid the price that was demanded by the Father so that we can have eternal relationship with God. Such is His love for us. Such is the love of Jesus and God for the world. But my dear precious friends, Jesus didn't remain dead. On the third day, Jesus rose again from the dead. His resurrection is proof that the Father accepted His punishment in full. It's proof that the Father had accepted the price that Jesus paid, His life for our sins. And so this morning, we celebrate the, our life as the life of a child of the King of Kings. He's done everything that's required for us to live in freedom. To live as conquerors over every single enemy that you may face. Be it health, sickness, sin, fear. Anything that seeks to rob you of your joy in Christ. Anything that seeks to take away that which God originally intended for you. The Lord has won a victory for you. This is the love. This is the reality of what Jesus did on the cross and his subsequent victory over death, my dear friends. And so this morning, I simply do what the Lord says. Remember me. Remember what I did for you. Remember my love for you. And so I invite you this morning to take of the bread Take of the blood. I'm going to ask Dr. Roberts to, to sing a song that he has on his heart for us this morning. And during the song, I want to invite you just to take of the bread, take of the blood. So, Father, I just thank you for your bread, the blood, for your body, Lord, the bread that we take of now and and of the blood which you shed on our behalf, Lord. Father, we gladly remember you. We gladly say thank you, precious Father. Thank you, precious Lord. Thank you for the great price that you paid so that we can have a relationship with you. Thank you that we, 
You've given us the victory, Lord. You've made us more than conquerors in every single area because of that great victory that you had for us, Lord. You be glorified, Father. We gladly take, we eat of your body, we drink of your blood, Lord. Amen. Oh, I thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful day. Amen. That we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. What a great celebration. Thank you, Lord. It's a song that I know most of us know. If you know it, you can sing along where you are. But just to bring us back again to the cross. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ alone, Thank you, Lord. my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drops and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving Thank you, love. My all in all, hearing the love of Christ, I say. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven, bless me. This gift of love. And righteousness Thank you, Lord. Scorned by the ones he came To save Till on that cross As Jesus died The wrath of God Was satisfied Woo. For every sin Thank you, Jesus. On him was laid Here in the dead of Christ I there in the ground His body lay Light of the world By darkness lay Then bursting forth Woo! In glorious day Thank you, Lord. All from the grave He rose again And as the sands In victory since cause has lost his grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. <laughs> Where are we right now? No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Life's first cry to find a breath. Jesus commands my destiny. Come and sing along. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home. Here in the power of Christ.
This is our anthem. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. Amen, amen. Phew, thank you, worship team. It's good being in the, th in the throne room. It's good worshiping God. Thank you, Slade. And thank you for your amazing team. Jan, you sound like an angel. This morning, I want to speak about being in the wrong place at the right time. We sometimes hear about people saying, I'm in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, this morning, I want to speak about being in the wrong place at the right time. If you have your Bibles with you, and I'm sure you do, in one way or the other, won't you please turn with me to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Just love worshiping the Lord. Just love the Lord. You should be there by now, I guess. Somewhere, Luke is just somewhere after Genesis, just before Revelation. Luke chapter 23, if you want to turn there, and I'm going to read two portions, starting at verse 32 and verse 33. There were also two criminals, or two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. When they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one in the right hand and the other on the left. Then if you can turn the same chapter, but go down a little bit to verse 39, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are now under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And verse 43 says, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Three men died that day. They were crucified side by side outside the walls of Jerusalem at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. This was the place where the Romans did their killing. This is the place where they did their executions publicly on view for the whole world to see. It wasn't located very far from the Damascus Gate. And so people going into the city and leaving the city would have a full view of this gruesome scene. Three men hanging on three separate crosses. Jesus of Nazareth hanging in the middle. Two men were crucified with him that day, one on his left, the other on the right. And so I want to spend some time this morning speaking about who these other two guys were. There were two other men, as you heard from this account, that were hanging on either side of Jesus. Who were they? The translators use different words to describe them. Thieves, robbers, bandits, criminals. Luke's word means members of the criminal class. They were professional criminals. They were members of the underworld. These guys were probably hoods, thugs. Probably men who killed for fun. Maybe they were assassins. Some writers seem to suggest 
that they may have been political revolutionaries bent on overthrowing the Roman government. If this were the case, you can call them, or you could think of them as terrorists. They would do whatever it took. They would use violence to achieve their political aims. Quite honestly, we don't know too much about these criminals. We don't know their names. We don't know where they were born, where they spent their life. We don't even know the actual crimes that they committed. Maybe they were partners in crime. Some commentaries seem to suggest that they may have been brothers. But honestly, we just don't know. So what do we know? I guess it's the best to start over there with what we do know. These guys were radically different. We also know that they took part in the greatest drama of all time. They were key players in witnessing the event of seeing our precious Jesus crucified. On quick reflection, it may appear that these two men were exactly alike. They were both criminals who'd been sentenced to die. They were sentenced to die at the same time, the same day. Both had been severely beaten before they were crucified. Both had been stripped naked before the mocking crowd. And both were definitely covered in blood and in dirt. Both men were dying. And both men would soon be dead. No one could look at them really and tell any difference. But in reality, no two men could be different, could be more different. These two men who were crucified on the outer crosses differed on one main point. How they viewed the man in the middle. They saw him differently. And therefore, they asked him different questions. Or they made different statements. One man wanted escape, not forgiveness. The other man wanted forgiveness, not not escape. Let's have a quick look at the at the criminal who wanted forgiveness. I don't think it's possible to be more desperate than this man. Brutally crucified, he's dying in agony for crimes that he had committed. He knows it. He's a guilty man being justly punished. He deserves to die. And by evening, he will be dead. His case has been tried, judgment has been announced, and is sentenced is being carried out. He has exhausted all legal avenues. This man is as close to death as you can be and still be alive. He was as good as dead. Now at the last moment, at the very last moment, he makes a final appeal to the Supreme Court of the universe. In verse 42, he says to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's many examples of saving grace in the Bible. I think this one must be, must top them all. Jesus is hanging next to him. A bloodied mess. A sight awful to behold. The man's feet and arms are nailed to the cross. Robes hold his body upright so he won't fall off. Every movement movement is agony. Every breath is torture. But that's not it. Can you imagine the, the scorn? Can you imagine the howling mob as they're screaming for blood? They jeer, they hiss, they curse. 
They laugh like a pack of wild hyenas. They cheer probably as he coughs up blood. And they probably shout approval when someone picks up a rock and throws it at him. It's brutal, it's inhuman. Yet it's sure. And it's sure amid the pain, the blood, the mockery, that this man comes to know Jesus. Somehow, this thief saw Jesus bleeding and naked, and yet he believed that somehow Jesus would accept him into his kingdom. This man sees Jesus at his weakest moment, at his most vulnerable moment, and he still believes in him. Wow. He's a crucified sinner trusting in a crucified Savior. No man ever looked less than a king or less like a king than Jesus did that day. Yet this man sees Jesus for for who he really is. Do you know, my dear friends, this man on the cross had none of the advantages that the disciples had. As far as we can tell, he had probably never heard of Jesus' teaching or his teachings by the seashore. He probably never saw Jesus heal or raise the dead. He knew nothing of the great miracles that Jesus had performed. This man had missed all the outward signs of of Jesus' kingship, yet he still believed. I don't think he knew anything of the virgin birth. I don't think he knew anything of the Old Testament prophecies. He probably didn't recall the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And I wonder if he actually witnessed the raising of Lazarus a mere week before Jesus' death. The coming miracle of the resurrection was totally unknown to him. You see, my dear friends, these are all things that we know and we take for granted. But this man on the cross knew nothing of these things. Yet there on the cross... He came to understand the heart of the gospel. In the crucified Jesus, beaten, mocked, forsaken, his very lifeblood flowing out of him, this thief sees Jesus as the king. This thief understood the crown of thorns on Jesus' brow. One crucified man saw another crucified man and believed in him. And that made the difference between heaven and hell. In that light, his words seem all the more absolutely remarkable. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. By saying that, Remember my name? He wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying, Lord, remember me, what a great guy I was, what a great criminal I was. Lord, when you get to heaven, why don't you put up a monument? I was one of the rebels. You know what he was saying? At the end of my world, at the end of my life as I know it, make a place for me in your kingdom. It's a modest prayer of a man who knows he does not deserve that which he is asking. When we put the totality of his words together, we can clearly see how great this man's faith really is. Verse 41 tells us this man recognizes that Jesus has done nothing wrong. He's prepared to put his faith in the person of Christ. What is the crucified saying? What is the crucified sinner 
saying as he was praying to the crucified Savior. By saying, Jesus, remember me, he was placing his faith in the power of Christ. By saying, Jesus, remember me, he was placing his faith in the mercy of Jesus. When you come into your kingdom, is what he says, he's placing his faith in the kingdom of God. I guess this prayer is a little bit unusual, isn't it? I haven't heard a prayer like that before. But it reminds us that God judges the sincerity of our hearts, not always the accuracy of our words. When you go to the doctor, when I go to the doctor, I don't normally know, doctor, what medicine I'm going to get. I don't even know what's wrong with me. But you know what I do? I trust the doctor. And I know, (laughs) I trust, and I put my faith in the fact that he will give me, he will prescribe to me the right medication to make me better, to fix me. Likewise, this poor thief, criminal, bandit, didn't know the right words to say. But you know what? What he said was good enough because he said it to the right person. When he said, Jesus, remember me, he actually didn't know, I don't think, everything that he was asking for. Before sundown, he received far more than he expected. thief on the cross was dying for his sins. A guilty man, justly punished. But you know what? He cries out to Jesus, and at the very last second, he was saved. How do we know the thief was saved? Because Jesus responds in verse 43, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus answers his request. And he gives him a promise that contains three parts. The first part, first promise, is that it's immediate salvation. Jesus uses the word today you will be with me in paradise. It's immediate. This very day, this very day of your crucifixion, this very day when your life on earth ends, you will be with me in paradise. Wherever paradise is, Jesus told the thief that he was going there that very day. The second promise which he gives the thief is personal salvation. The phrase means to be with me in a very personal way. It's not you guys or you over there. But you and me together, side by side. It means to be in the personal presence of someone, of another person. Wherever Jesus was going, this man was going to be with him. Wherever Jesus was going, that criminal would be with him. Let's sink in for a moment. Wherever Jesus was going, that man was going to be with him. That's paradise. I think sometimes we focus on the details of heaven so much that we might miss the big picture. We wonder, I wonder what my loved ones are doing in heaven. But even in our best moments, we can only imagine. We know so little of what life is like on the other side. But this much is true. Heaven is where Jesus is. And to be with him is to be in heaven. 
If I've been away on a long trip, or even a short trip, I may say to someone, I can't wait to get home again. I'm not talking about the TV and the furniture and the structure of my home. It's not as if when I come in, I say, hello, TV, or hello, windows, hello, door. You'd probably think I've gone totally crazy if I did that. No, home is precious to me because that's where my wife is. That's where my family is. When I say I can't wait to go home, you know what I'm actually saying, what I mean? I can't wait to see my loved ones again. It's the same thing with heaven. The glory of heaven is not the streets of gold or the gates of pearl or even the river of life or even the angels. The glory of heaven is Jesus. Heaven is wherever Jesus is. When we finally get to where Jesus is, we'll be home for all eternity. The third promise Jesus gives the criminal is when Jesus uses the word paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Scholars tell us that paradise was given, was originally given or referred to the walled gardens of the Persian kings. The king would invite you to walk with him in the, the twilight hours to come and view his majestic gardens. That would be paradise. The same word was used in the Greek Old Testament to refer to the Garden of Eden. Strangely, it's the same word used in Revelation 2 and verse 7. It's a place of beauty, of openness, of eternal blessedness. If we take these three promises together, we can see what a remarkable thing Jesus is actually saying. He is saying that this bandit who has lived his entire life in crime will, upon his death, be transferred to heaven where he will be in the eternal presence of Jesus Christ. This man was in the right place at the right time. Can I say that this guy hits the jackpot big time? <laughs> in the morning, he's in prison. At noon, he's hanging on a cross. By sundown, he's in paradise out of a life of sin and shame he passes immediately into eternal blessedness <laughs> I love that and you know what we recently have had a spate of people that we love very dearly that have gone home to be at the Lord but we can take great comfort in this fact as we say goodbye to our loved to our loved ones who love the Lord. At the very moment a believer dies, he or she is in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Immediately. That's what Paul meant when he said that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Heaven begins the moment we cross the narrow divide of this life into the next. Not 50 years after we die, or 150 years later, or 1,500 years later. Now, we have the Lord's word on this. This man, this thief, this scoundrel, this professional criminal. This man who, I wonder, if he had to show up in church today, he would probably scare us. He'd be quite weird. I wonder if this man had to move into our town. I wonder how many people would say, I know his reputation, I've heard what he's done, I'm out of here. This man went directly from the cross to paradise. 
And so as I read the story and as I relay it to you, I'm trusting that you receive some hope, some encouragement. And I want to give you three quick pointers in that regard. The first one, my dear and precious friends, to those of you that are listening, to those of you that are here, it's never too late to turn to Jesus. Sometimes people say, I'm too old for this or I'm too old for that. I've been going to gym a couple of times and I've been going with my son. He's just started going. I've been going for a long time. He's already passed me. I'm too old for this, man. <laughs> Sometimes it's true on the physical level. As you get older, there are some things you just can't do anymore. Back to life. But no one can ever say that it's, you're too old to turn to Jesus. It's never too late to turn to him, my dear friends. As long as there's life, as long as there's breath, as long as your heart still beats, the invitation from Jesus stands. Can someone be saved at the last second? Because of God's amazing love, the answer is yes. Someone can be saved at the last second. Those of us praying for some of our loved ones who don't know the Lord should take great hope from stories like this. Sometimes we look at people and we say, there's no hope for them. They'll never come to Jesus. And we get discouraged and we stop we stop praying for them. The story teaches us that no one is ever too far gone. It's true. He waited until the very last moment, to the very last second. But it's also true that in that very last second, he was saved. Don't ever give up on those you love. They may, like this wretched thief, waste an entire lifetime and then in the end, they turn to Christ. Don't despair. Don't despair for yourself. Don't despair for anyone else. It's never too late to turn to Christ. I know I've said that same sentence several times. I'm going to say it again. It's never too late to turn to Christ. Whilst there's life in you. The second encouragement and hope that I want to leave with you is even the very worst can be saved at the very last moment. Sometimes I hear people being a little bit cynical, or they're making fun, or they, they're mocking these, these last-minute deathbed conversions as if these things don't ever happen. Well, let me tell you they do happen. We've all witnessed them. People that are just... Ungodly for their whole lives at the last moment, they come to know the Lord on their deathbed. Let me tell you why they do happen. If a person knows they're dying, don't you think it's likely that they're thinking about where they're going to be spending tomorrow or eternity? I'm not for a moment suggesting that anybody should wait until their last minute before making a call to the Lord. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that you should live a life full of evil with the intention of coming to Christ just before you die. Many people don't have that opportunity, that luxury, that privilege. As far as we can tell, the thief who believed in Jesus had no prior knowledge of him. I guess this makes his conversion even the more re remarkable. I want to encourage every single person who's here, who's out there, 
Do not put off tomorrow what you should do today. I'm sure that if we could speak to the, to the thief on the cross today, he would say, don't delay. Make the call now. Give your heart to Jesus right away. Remember, two thieves were crucified with Jesus that day, but only one believed. The fact remains that this man was a very bad man, but he was saved at the very last moment. And thank God it's so. He had lived an absolutely rotten life. Yes, he died a Christian death. You know why it happened? By the grace of Jesus. I know that some people might feel that they've gone too far in sin to ever be forgiven. And some people feel so enslaved in their habits that they despair from ever being set free. Many people would do anything to be forgiven, but they think that forgiveness is impossible. Let me put this matter plainly. It doesn't matter where you've been sleeping. It doesn't matter what you've been drinking. It doesn't matter who you've been with, what you've done. It doesn't matter what sins you've committed. It doesn't even matter if you've broken the Ten Commandments, all of them, this week. You can be saved right now. <laughs> Please don't go out there and say, well, Steve gave me an excuse to do this. I'm not saying that. That's not the context in which I'm speaking. I'm saying that when you come to Jesus with whatever, whatever sin you've committed, he will forgive you. If this man can be saved, anyone can be saved. If there's hope for him, there's hope for you. And my dear friends, if he can make it to heaven, so can you. If Jesus would take him, he'll take you. My last point of hope and encouragement this morning is God has made salvation so simple, so simple that anyone can be saved. Salvation independent of the sacraments. This man was never baptized. He never had the joy and the privilege of partaking of the Lord's Supper like we had the moment ago. And you know what? He never made amends for his bad life. But he made it to heaven. All that God wants from each and every one of us is simple faith in Jesus. Salvation independent of the church. This man never made it to church. He never had time to walk down the aisle to say the sinner's prayer. He never attended Bible studies or COVID support groups. He never gave his money, but he made it to heaven. My dear friends, salvation independent of good works. This man couldn't lift a, a hand. His hands were nailed, tied to the cross. He couldn't run any errands for the Lord. His feet were tied to the cross. Couldn't give him any, couldn't give a dime. Couldn't give a penny. Probably didn't have any. For this man, there was no way in but the mercy and the grace of God. He was pardoned before he lived a single righteous day. In one transforming moment, a man who was not fit to live on earth was made fit to live in heaven. Wow. And so my dear friends, in conclusion, I take my stand this morning with this criminal on the cross. I claim the same mercy. We all get to heaven the same way, by the grace and the mercy of Jesus.
That's what God wants from us. And that's all that he'll accept. It's simple. It's simple faith in his son, Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in the Lord Jesus, in that very moment, we are saved. The question, the challenge I ask is simple. Are you ready to die? I don't like to talk about death. I don't mind speaking about death. I know where I'm going. You've got nothing to fear if you know the Lord. My dear friends, you are not ready to die if you don't know Jesus. I want to just put it as blatantly as that. You are not ready to die until you know the Lord. Do you know him? So my question is, what will you do if you don't know him? So I invite you this morning to reach out to Jesus. Your prayer doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be theologically correct for the great God of God's forgive you but you know what he does want what he does demand is a heart of sincerity i encourage you don't leave it later do it now if you don't know how speak to me speak to someone who's a christian but it's not hard It's like that thief. He didn't have time to go to the local church and say, hey, pastor, can you help me? He appealed to the great king of kings. Don't leave it till later. I encourage you to do it right away. May God bless you. My dear friends, you are here at the right time, the right place. May God bless you. Happy Easter. Amen. Can I ask you just to close your eyes and pray? Yeah. Oh, Lord, we've got so much to be grateful for. Lord, we serve a risen, a risen God. A God who died, a God who rose again for me, for us, so that we can have relationship with you, Lord. Lord, thank you that your blood has made us righteous. Not our works. Your blood, Lord. And so, Father, we just, again, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Father, I just pray that this morning that there will be many lives who are pardoned this morning. Many lives who are redeemed because of the blood of your son. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you for this wonderful gift. Thank you for this wonderful relationship that you desire with us. We love it. We thrive it. We love in you. We love you, Lord. You be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. See you next week.